Yeah, I've noticed that Rob Brotherton's on the call, so um, I better be nice and get it right. Um, so, yeah, so this is the River Stour fixed deck bridge renewal um, that um, we implemented a couple of years ago using the Delcor Alt 1 base plate system. Uh, the presentation I'll be giving today, I'll be doing with Peter Barber. Uh, Peter, a lot of you will know from um, his time on LUL. He subsequently does a lot of work now with um, Delcor. Uh, amongst other things. So he's going to help me present part of the presentation. So we'll, we'll split it into sort of six sections. We'll, we'll give an overview of the, the project relationships on, um, on, this, on this specific project. Uh, we'll cover off the existing site to give you sort of a, an idea of the constraints associated with it. Uh, we'll go through optioneering um, because no doubt um, a lot of you be thinking why well, we've gone for a fixed deck bridge as opposed to ballasted. So we'll, we'll cover off that, um, that that reasoning. We'll then cover off the, the bridge to ballast interface um, and explain some of the issues that we, we, we sort of will could propagate as part of, of going from a very stiff to a, to a less stiff um, track form. We'll cover off design developments of some of the ancillary interfaces that we had to deal with um, as part of implementing um, what, is, what was at the time a fairly new piece of infrastructure onto network rail, um, which has now subsequently been uh, approved. And then we'll go through some of the slides looking at construction and operation um, and um, just discuss sort of performance afterwards with, with help from Peter. So looking at the project relationships then. Um, so this was part of the CP6 multifunctional framework, which is still ongoing uh, with Bam Nuttall as the, uh, the, the main contractor. Uh, John Ferguson was CM. And then within there, you can see sort of some of the, uh, the companies involved. Um, Sonic Rail Services, SRS, uh, Stuart Callahan Survey, who provided uh, not only topographical survey, but setting out control on site for the actual construction phase. Um, ourselves within Mont McDonald, uh, which covered track, civils and traction power. And then obviously Peter Barber, who um, was our sort of interface with Delcor and helped us sort of develop um, the proposal that we're going to cover in this presentation. So just to cover off the existing site then, um, you can see roughly there the big red dot points to where it is. So we are just to the west of uh, Canterbury in Kent. Um, it's located on the Ashford to Ramsgate line. Um, it's about a quarter of a mile to the west of Chartham station on the ACR line, approximately 66 miles and 77 chains. Um, it's a dual line corridor uh, consisting of an up and down fast line. Um, it's category two um, and the, on the alignment on the approach, um, looking at the photo to the north, or which is actually west, um, it's fairly long straight on approach um, as you go across the bridge and towards uh, Chartham Station, it enters a, a, a long, relatively flat right handed curve, um, which is cantered and the cant transition extends uh, fully across the bridge. Um, either side and it is cantered as well, which is obviously one of the constraints we had. Um, you can also see immediately to the, um, what will be the east, but to the bottom of the bridge, um, we have a foot crossing. This is Dibley's foot crossing. Um, there are a number of residential properties that are but close to the railway at this point. Um, the estate to the top left also has a clinic. Uh, the top right is an area of quite open, um, lightly wooded land, uh, which was um, identified eventually as sort of the construction area. And then obviously we've got the river, the River Stour, which flows um, at a bit of an angle to the railway and the bridge is angled accordingly. And you can see there with the section appendix extract um, whereabouts it sits. Um, there is third rail in the area. Um, it stops short of the uh, the bridge on both lines and then commences clear of the um, uh, foot crossing. So that's quite a big gap that it, it, it sort of goes, doesn't encroach on the bridge. Um, line speed 
it was or is currently 70 miles an hour. There was a, um, a scheme in around 2016 to look to increase the line speed in the area. You can see that we've got 80 miles an hour um, either side of this site. Uh, the bridge was a constraining factor and so why, why it wasn't incorporated as part of that. Uh, some photos again of the of the existing bridge as was. Um, it's a three span structure with non continuous decks supported on brick masonry abutments or piers. Sorry, um, the spans are approximately seven meters each. Um, the spans are made of wrought iron, which you can see in this photo here, um, uh, with fabricated through plate girders, and they're supporting the uh, long wheel timbers or the longitudinal timbers that you can just about see in this photo. Um, those are coupled together with curved deck plates, which which run between the longitudinal timbers. Um, either side of the bridge, we have um, F24 concrete sleepers. Um, the rail is welded 756 throughout. Um, the structure itself was deemed to be beyond economic repair, so it was put into the work bank for renewal. Uh, although the piers themselves were deemed and the abutments were deemed to be in, in serviceable condition. But once we'd sort of got into the, the fact that we were looking at a bridge replacement and not a uh, upgrade or, or sort of a, a fix in a, renew, a, it was a full renewal activity. Um, obviously, being a track engineer, I sort of inquired about potential for ballast track system because that's preferent that's preference um, for performance for us. Um, the bridge itself, um, they, they looked at two options, whether to use the existing abutments and piers or whether to have a single deck uh, spanning the um, in, entire river. And then obviously from a track system perspective, we, we sort of looked at ballast track and fixed deck. Um, at the time, FFUs were sort of Possibly, maybe, but I think given the, the track category, um, the preference was not to entertain longitudinal timbers and to go for either ballasted or, or fixed deck. Um, that's kind of where we got to. So for the bridge option, we looked at a number of U-span uh, beam sections. Um, we had a standard U-beam as a single span option, which was quite deep. Um, and then we had um, a couple of billeted decks, uh, deck options as well. Uh, we did model it for 300 mil of ballast um, on the basis of it being a category two line. Um, the constraining factor with this, unfortunately, was um, uh, the river, basically. So the profile of the bridge um, being long timber was quite sort of low. Um, one of the considerations we had was the, um, the soffit level in relation to the river. Um, the river was prone to flooding. Um, so we got this information from the Environment Agency looking at the, uh, the actual river levels um, based on um, flood mapping, obviously with the um, looking at future proofing as well. Um, by lowering the bridge level, to accommodate the 300 mil of ballast and sleepers, etc., that, that puts in a position where we couldn't really um, realistically provide a bridge solution. Um, by pushing it up, um, that brought in a number of other constraints as well. Um, so it would have, or everything would have lifted the track accordingly. That would have had impacts on line side infrastructure, it would have had impacts on um, the uh, foot crossing. And it would have also increased exponentially the, the amount of track renewal that we needed to do, um, which didn't fit with the possession plan and wasn't accounted for in terms of cost. Um, as such, it probably would have killed the scheme. So we, we kind of looked at all these different impacts. Um, and then we sort of progressed then on to looking at a fixed deck option, which gives us a, a very much lower profile. One of the considerations for this, obviously, is how we get it into position. Um, as I said earlier on, we looked at the area sort of in the picture to the um, top right. That obviously was a long lift, um, so that had to be taken into account. So that lent itself more to a um, three span option using the uh, existing piers. Um, it also reduced the profile of the bridge um, because obviously you've got these inter interim um, support 
uh, beams um, as opposed to having quite a stiff single span bridge um, and that's kind of where we got to in terms of the development so what we took forward was um, these these um, three span bridges or actually six decks as it was in effect because you've got one track running through each of the u-beam sections um, I love a flow chart. So this is kind of one that we used for the decision mapping uh, as part of the optioneering, um, just to pull out the different options, um, looking at sort of is a flood resilience, what type of lifting do we need? Uh, do we need to strengthen foundations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the civil engineering team came up with that, but obviously I'm fed into it as well. Um, and I thought it was quite a, a good tool and I thought I'd share it with you. Now we'll go on to the uh, bridge to ballast interface, which is kind of the, the crux of the issue. So obviously having gone with a um, ballast, a, a fixed deck bridge, we've now created an, sorry, uh, we've now created an interface for ourselves in that you're going from something that's very stiff, which is a, a concrete deck bridge, onto um, a less stiff um, ballast to track formation. So obviously how we manage those differential stiffnesses is, is, is quite key. Um, because obviously if, if we don't manage that properly, this can then lead to um, fundamentally alignment faults, which is rough ride. Um, so thinking about sort of passing comfort, it puts additional pressures and, and forces into componentry leading to early failure. Um, it, it can also lead to substructure failure as well, which exasperates the, the issue. Um, we can, it can lead to loss of uh, ballast um, either through um, grinding it away so that it becomes smaller or lateral displacement which is basically forcing it out of the sides and, and obviously as you as you grind the ballast you lose that cohesive bonding so what you're doing is accelerating uh, the deterioration of the track in extreme cases you can also look at lateral loading onto the structure which is not geared up to do so you can actually affect the performance and, and the life of the structure um, and then fundamentally, from a maintenance point of view, it's difficult to, to manage those interfaces because obviously you've got to run the tamper as close as possible and then potentially look at um, um, uh, hand packing or, or similar type activities. Um, so we just need to manage that. We, we looked at a few, we've sort of considered a few options. We looked at uh, p potentially um, a traditional uh, ballast slab, which is where you sort of tail off. Um, the issues there were trying to integrate it as part of the existing abutment, um, which, which was deemed to be difficult to do. Um, the VTRAS system from Romberg was considered, but at the time hadn't been trialled anywhere. It subsequently has. There's, there's a few places where it's now on network rail infrastructure. And so quite early on, we got into a position where we were looking to manage the transition using the components themselves. Um, so at this point, I will now hand you over to Peter, who will talk more about sort of the different systems that we employed. Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, as Darren introduced, I've sort of got a history in slab track, so um, formerly with LU. Um, so really, I started in, um, Chris got in touch with me about various systems and um, went for optioneering. And, um, you know, the, the thing with resilience is we tend not to manage it probably as well as we should do. We look at it as a vertical deflection rather than a global deflection. And I think that's sort of one mistake that is now coming onto the radar of network rail as well. Um, so um, what we, the conventional system tends to go up and down. So laterally it can be very stiff. Historically, a lot of products are laterally stiff. And um, yeah, we we do suffer from a uh, breakdown of components, as you see in the picture, which usually go into the screw or bolt, whatever. Um, also, it can convert itself into high frequency vibration, which is airborne noise. Um, and obviously that enhances the uh, growth of defects on the rail. So um, laterally, laterally stiff rail can be very problematic uh, where you've got flange contact. 
Um, where you've got a resilient layer, the way I've always looked at it is that you don't want a steel member going through there. As soon as you've got a steel member going through a resilient layer, you're liable to fatigue. As soon as you get into plastic deformation, that means um, it will fail. It's uh, just a matter of time. And you either got to manage that failure by good understanding of what's happening, um, or my preference is you move it. Um, also, some of these systems can be very complicated. This sort of, you know, require special tooling, special skills, etc. So, in the selection process, I've always looked at getting something that's that's simple to do. Um, and also, on some of these systems, there is perceived um, by some of the operators like Network Round and Underground to be a lack of technical support to manage them, etc. Um, which you know is open to interpretation because obviously you've got to go back to the guys but you know it needs a two-way process okay chris um so anyway i've been involved with resilient base plates over the past oh, too many years 20 odd years and we developed the deep tube track form on lu to sort of bounce ourselves back into the, the modern world um the alt one is a compression plate so it's effectively it's the cousin of the um what used to be the egg um so this is a simpler version of it um doesn't give you the same noise and vibration properties but is um, generally deemed to be the better plate to use when you're after performance enhancements um it's been around all well, this concept has been around for over 40 years and um yeah, so basically what you've got, if you look at the bottom picture, is a cast iron top plate, a bottom plate. They are held together in a in a mould and then the rubber is injected into them to chemically bond them together. So the bonding would be the same sort of bonding you would get in a bridge bearing or a car mount, that sort of bonding. So it's very well proven system um very durable and you know if failures are going to occur they occur during manufacture very very rarely do you ever get any defects in fact in london underground i don't think there has been a single debonding issue um in the sort of 15 17 kilometers that they put in um they will actually um because of the sort of 180 degree resilience you've got in it you does actually as a default as a benefit um slow the propagation down on rail defects although obviously with the complexity of rear rail interface there's always going to be one or two curves that catch you out um but 90 percent of the time we tend to to put these in and we find that we get no worse and usually it's better um we have had the odd one where we've got very slight flange contact that's caused us issues um, but you know we can we can look to work with whoever to try and optimize that to reduce that effect um the focus of this one is obviously you know we we wanted to make sure that we had something on the railway that reduces fatigue on the bolts um so effectively if you can imagine a resilient system with lateral resilience you actually get a bend in the rail both vertically and laterally by having that bend over four or five meters, you can actually reduce the loading on individual plates. So laterally, you reduce the stresses onto the bolts, thereby removing the fatigue issue, um, hopefully completely unless you're on really tight curves. Um, vertically, you do the same, so you then sort of reduce your peak loadings, and also the plate doesn't see that loading because as you can see, there's no, there isn't a bottom to the plates, the, the forces from the vertical deflection goes straight into the formation layer of concrete. Um, this was uh, one of the test sites we put the plate on. So we had a, a stiffness transition of uh, Edelon level crossing. Um, we were supposed to have a tunnel, but that was um, halted due to reinforcing, reinforcing bar issues. And um, so this was really the first one. So within it, we also had um, some testing on vibration a baseline point where we started from where we finished etc to make sure it, it it hit that criteria okay next one chris um this basically gives you an idea of the deflection curve it comes in multiple stiffnesses um the core values are 17 kilonewton for metro type use 
22 kilonewton for general mixed traffic and 35 kilonewton the stiffer one is basically a way of managing your way back into the existing system um the we can work on other stiffnesses uh, but obviously that's something that we need to work with go back to milton Keynes and discuss with the guys to work it out it's it's not a showstopper it's allowed for in the product approval but we just need to manage it with the powers to be um as you can see deflection curve the red curve is fault mode so that's worst case scenario you're effectively bottoming out the base plate on that one and the others you can see you've got the bogey running through there and probably between the bogeys you've got sort of coming on to four meters either side of it where the rail is deflecting hence you get the the loss of peak loading due to it um when the when the rubber goes into fault mode and bottoms out this is what we call secondary stiffness so both laterally and vertically when we get to an impact point which causes an overload all that happens is rubber just goes into full compression and stays there so there's no safety risk it won't go beyond its limit and keep stretching it will just bottom out and act like a effectively a cast iron base plate and that's in both um, both planes the testing is done the same as a cast iron base plate so there's no danger of the base plate breaking under that loading because that has been allowed for within the testing criteria and design um so that's what we got so so basically you've got these two plates which you could these three plates which you can see which are approved on network rail um the same stiffness is used on lu um but we are in discussions about modifying this to enhance performance since the advent of night tube there are noise vibration issues which we can probably enhance this plate to benefit some of the light rail systems and um some of the mass transit systems off network rail okay chris um because of the way this base plate evolved um it was originally used for deep tube work so the base difference between the base plate sleeper and the lu sleeper uh, lu base plate and the network rail base plate is the category of use so lu is a category b and network rail is category c so a slightly stronger plate we deliberately made it with the same footprint um unfortunately the drawing is showing a check sleeper for the delcor check which is on lu that's a double check but effectively the holes are closer together to allow for the um alt 417 to fit on there um so it was designed on LU, it's used on check curves and stiffness transitions, and also with a cast iron base plate, it's used for undersleeper pad noise and vibration mitigation. Um, it's got a very large footprint, as you can see, which obviously gives you benefit. The increased weight will will aid sort of retention of alignment, etc. Um, it's fully approved now. I think there's about seven or eight installations of it, so. Um, all appears to be working well. Uh, manufacturers moved back to Derby, so um, we've moved away from the teething troubles of Rochester, which is probably a benefit. Um, very good performance. It's fit for both LU systems on conductor rail and network rail now, so that's all been accommodated. Um, so, yeah, it's working well. Okay, thanks, Chris. So, the stiffness transition. Um, basically which was developed via the some installations in Australia um, through LU and is now sort of being rolled out on network rail. So the basic idea of this is that we keep all the movement out of the ballast. Um, and a lot of people forget that, you know, laterally, lateral movement does cause issues because you get this slight rolling of the sleeper, which just rocks a ballast and causes a cohesive bonding in the top layer, which is a critical layer, just to lose just to lose that cohesive bonding, and then we get ballast flow, etc., which can cause what well, does cause us issues. Um, so the the principle of this one is that we we use the bend radius of the rail to reduce the loads out. Um, we don't do the transition on the bridge deck because you've optimised the stiffness for the bridge deck, and the last thing you want to do is on the most critical area of the bridge, increase the stiffness, um, whether it's for noise and vibration or for stresses. So principally what we do, we haven't put the ballast ramp that's required 
um, on this drawing purely because it's just make it too complicated. Um, the length is related to the speed, hence this is a concentrated one. Um, so normal construction, we tend to put a geogrid in the base as a as a catch-all um, to stop lateral migration of the stone, and then a standard 300 mil below. The spacing is dictated by the stiffness you're trying to manage off. Um, so it's it's really you know as far as the P-way gangs installing and maintaining it concerned, it's a bit of balanced track. Um, there is no additional interventions required once it's installed. In fact, the installation, apart from sleepers being heavier, is exactly the same as you would have for any other one. Okay, Chris. Right, the, this is, the picture shows the story one. It's quite a long stiffness transition, mainly because of speed. And um, as it's category two, we're liable to have freight, freight loading of 25 tonnes. So we had to manage that that through obviously slower speeds and lighter axle loads we can shorten it um and once you get to a certain length you lose the ability to you end up with a step change there's no value um so with this system there's no preload in a rubber um which means that when you the rubber will start to deflect at quite a long distance because you haven't got that preload. The benefit of that is also you haven't got a pivot point, which means you don't get uplift on it. So with a system that's got a preload on it, you get like a rocking point where it can't deflect before the additional weight comes along to overcome that preload. So you will actually get an uplift in the system. With this, you don't get it because the only preload you've got is a static weight of the rail. Um, so we, we utilize the bend radius but we don't need to change the rubber on every single base plate because we've got a long bend radius. As the train rolls along, it then picks up the stiffer one four meters away and that slowly stiffens the rail up as you get more and more of the stiffer Delcors under it. As you can see in the picture, there's green, which are the 35 kilonewtons and there is black, which is a 22. So we try and make it as idiot proof as we can. Um, the 17s come out at gray. So the idea is that, you know, if something's gone awry, it, it jumps out at you. Um, as I said before, we keep all the, we manage all the resilience top side of the sleeper. The sleeper is designed to take less stress than you would see in a normal railway. So the idea of this is um, we, we want this to last as long, if not longer than the plane on either side of it to reduce the interventions and keep the management of the system the same. Um, there's no addition, no additional intrusive onto the formation. We haven't got big lumps of concrete going in. It's basically a normal track formation um, and we keep the loadings the same. So possession times, um, apart from the complexity of having a heavier sleeper, it's identical to a normal track renewal. So we can keep that going. Um, if you do put a concrete slab in these things and run it through there, what I've found is that we you reduce the thickness layer of the ballast. So although you stop the settlement, you actually increase the damage, the cohesive bonding between the granite particles, which does cause the ballast to break up early. So although that the concrete slab system does work in the early stages, as soon as your ballast has lost, um, lost its cohesive bonded, you lose top and line there. Um, another thing that was, this is, goes back to my LU days, we stress that it had to have existing tooling. So we don't want, you know, we want the maintainer to come along and all he sees is a base plate with a pan drill clip in it, screw down, exactly what he's used to. He's got no other, no other work, no other tools to bring on site. He's got no other um, skill sets to, to learn. It's just simple for him. Um, the simplest transitions we can tailor for operating needs, so weight and speed. We can, you know, also, you know, if you have got additional noise and vibration requirements, can extend it, or we can mix and match with undersleeper pads on them to, to work it through if you've got a severe noise complaint coming off a, a slab tra track. Um, uh, and really, you know, program implications, once people get over the fear of a different track form, it is it's 
relatively, you know, you, you've got to lift a concrete sleep a set of program implications once you get your head around what it is, a zero. Yes, please, Chris. Um, apologies for the picture. Um, my fault, the internet went down. I didn't get around to sending out the, the proper one. Uh, in fact, I'm shacked up in a mate's place at the moment doing the presentation. Um, as you can see, this shows the blue line is the stiffness of the rubber on the base plate. So you can see the step going back, coming off the bridge onto the 22s, then onto the 35s and then back to the um, conventional track. The conventional track, as you can see, we're assuming it's in good order and deflecting no more than about 1.5 millimeters. So you can see you come off the bridge, pretty static, um, very minor drop coming off it. That's that's just basically to keep the sleeper spacing identical. We can play with the sleeper spacing to get rid of that sub millimeter drop, but I don't really think it's worthwhile. Then as the train comes along, it starts to pick up the additional stiffness of the 35s and that then stiffens the rail up. So it starts to come along. And as you run off the stiffness of the 22s you, in the midpoint of the 35s, you can see you've stabilized at where the optimum deflection would be for that plate. And then it, picks up the legacy sleepers and, and runs itself up. Um, we do end up with a little bit of damage on the legacy sleepers, but you know, it, it's minimal. Um, we do recommend that you change the pads coming off on the legacy sleepers for a softer one to accommodate that sort of 0.2 of a millimeter change. Um, it works really well. I've put these on the net line and to my knowledge, um, once it was installed, they've never shifted. Uh, the trace from New Haven level crossing, up to three years, three years install, installed, um, the trace is identical and you can't differentiate between the original trace and the trace as is now. So um, they are performing well. Um, nobody said anything about them. So um, everything seems to be good news on this one, which is nice to see. Okay, Chris. Okay. okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, so obviously with the, um, the the updated componentry or the new componentry that was being implemented onto the, the railway, we, we came up with a, a number of um, interface issues, but also, as I mentioned earlier, there was a part of a wider LSI scheme, the aspirational 80 miles an hour. Um, so Network Rail originally asked us to consider adopting this as part of the scheme. Uh, so we did a bit of a case study um, on the design that had been uh, provided, I think it was by Halcro in 2015. Uh, within itself, there was nothing wrong with the design. It's just that it was for a realignment scheme only, uh, which didn't take into account the um, renewal activities. Um, the form A was somewhat out of date, as was the survey, so we had to validate the survey anyway. Um, it kind of taken a bit of a liberty with the bridge, assuming that the bridge would be um, replaced, which obviously it was. However, the revised alignment we needed for the, the bridge um, construction um, didn't align with it. So in the end, we, we kind of just went back to network rail and um, sort of said, that unfortunately, we, we're going to have to sort of develop it um, additionally. But you get an idea there from, from that picture of the sort of the geometry through site with the long straight on the approach and then the sort of transition over the bridge. Um, so that was the sort of, that was the um, design that we reviewed. Um, so once that was sort of cleared, we then were allowed to um, progress with our own design development. So sort of revisiting the um, the transition, obviously that's a can transition associated with the, the 2200 meter curves. Um, as we'd gone to a fixed deck arrangement, um, we we sort of needed to review that in terms of what that meant for the construction um, and also the ongoing maintenance. Um, obviously, because of having that transition running all the way across the bridge and either side makes it a real headache, and it, it would probably set up a um, an alignment fault uh, that w would be very difficult, if not impossible, to to sort of treat. Um, so the proposal we sort of came up with um, was around not installing cant at all. Um, we did look at realigning the track um, and what that would do. Uh, fundamentally, extending the straight impacts on um, line side boundaries, which was, would have been an issue. 
Um, extending the curve would have created um, similar issues on the other side, but also would have put in a uh, quite a flat reverse, which would have extended the, the, the redesign. But fundamentally, realigning the track took us off the existing abutments and, and bridge piers. And so um, we wouldn't be able to reinstate the bridge based on those and the work would increase accordingly. Um, so we did look to retain the existing through alignment. And what we did instead is we uh, implemented a zero cant option. Um, so what we what we looked at there was um, using the sort of higher deficiency that had come out of um, things like Hatfield and, and how that is actually beneficial to track. And with the subsequent changes to 2102 and in how we sort of calculate and measure um, high deficiency rates and, and high deficiencies, uh, we were able to take advantage of that. Additionally, because we were asked to look at the LSI to incorporate the 80 miles an hour as opposed to 70, this would have extended the works through to Chartham anyway. So we took advantage of the fact that we were able to recant the adjacent curves and look to sort of instate that as zero. Um, so what we ended up with, while it's not brilliant in terms of maintainability, you've still got a geometric transition. We've, we've got away from the cant, so there's less likely to be uh, twist faults propagated. And then from a construction point of view with the bridge deck, we, we simplified that by having everything on the same plane, albeit with the, with the um, through geometry. Um, that was the profile of the bridge that's sitting on one of the central piers. You can see the bearings sat on there. So obviously there was a little bit of work around the, um, uh, the, the, the pier um, in order to make the pad sit. Um, you've got the up and down sat within their own trough, and there was a lot of work around the design of that to get the gauge clearance. Um, then there was a lot of debate about these walkways. Um, they they ended up being only accessible from one side, which I didn't quite understand. Um, they, they're effectively quite a large um, cable trough, if I'm being honest. Um, they are blanked off at the end with the foot crossing. Um, so you can walk onto the bridge, but can't walk off. Um, so I suppose in terms of inspecting part of the bridge, it might be useful, but it's not a through route and it's not something you can step in and out of. So I was a little bit um, unsure as to why the walkway had been designed in that way, given that there was no through route. Um, but we are there. So, but that's that's effectively what we ended up with in terms of construction. You can see there that the uh, that we've simplified the alignment. You can also see the third rail um, on, the, on the track, as, on the bridge as well. Um, as the bridge is skewed at around 70% um, due to the river, we had to look at how we interface that, obviously using the, the Delcor system, um, and how we stepped off the bridge, which was skewed onto um, the, the Semex sleepers. Um, so we're working with the um, the, the uh, bridge designers, um, we came up with an arrangement whereby we uh, use this um, addition to the to the um, abutments in order to get that um, straight line that we needed to interface with the um, sleepers. Um, you'll see there there's a little bit of a step out of the base plates at the end. Um, we discussed that with Peter to determine the sort of levels of deflection um, or lack of as you space them closer together. Um, but it's fairly negligible um, given sort of not having that that type of arrangement. Um, the final sort of insert looks like that with the rails um, abutting onto it and also the. Um, um, sorry, somebody's trying to call me. Um, yeah, so you can see there with the Semex sleepers abutting up to the um, um, insert adjacent to the bridge. Um, in order to get that interface managed properly. Obviously, with the extension of the third rail onto a concrete deck, we do have the risk of stray currents, which is um, current strain uh, going from the traction rail into the bridge and then re-entering the track system. It's at the point where it re-enters that it's a problem. Um, so there was a lot of discussion around uh, the potential for um, protection of the rail. We discussed um, a, uh, the, the, what did we discuss? We discussed the Zinoco rail, which is effectively a, a galvanized rail. It's a bit more science behind the protection used on that, but the process is effectively the same where you have a sacrificial layer um, that is um, 
that allows um, the straight current to enter into the rail, but instead of attacking the steel, it attacks the, um, the zinc coating. Unfortunately, that's only a, a temporary measure because you're not stopping that process from happening. You're, you're just delaying the, the impact on the rail foot. So instead, we looked at the uh, relative performance of the um, base plate itself uh, because you've got this bonded rubber layer between the uh, the two um, iron uh, plates effectively that builds up a, a one uh, mega ohm of uh, electrical protection or insulation uh, we coupled that with a small hdpe packer under the base plate to add that as additional um, resilience um, the quite high performance within the hdpe pad so there's very little uh, deformation coming from the, the loading. Um, obviously, with the LUL sleeper, there's an issue with compatibility over insulator pots. Um, there's only one common fitting, which I think is the S1, um, which is effectively a quite a squat one used in the ramps. And as a result, we had to um, look at the differential um, drillings um, within the within the uh, Semex sleeper. I've not included an S1. I've, inc uh, I've included an S1 in the in the photo there, so you can see the, the different drilling holes because that's universal fitting. Um, what we found is that the um, network rail specification tended to have quite narrower holes, but longer laterally. Um, and so we did talk to Semex um, about recasting they were initially sort of keen to support, but as they were looking to shut down, uh, we ran out of time. Unfortunately, we did look at packing um, additional plates, but we got to a point where we sort of spoke to SRS um, and looking at the sort of rebar design, we got we, we were able to drill the holes in situ. Um, subsequently, um, Semex have reviewed this and are now making the NR compatible sleepers available. Um, which are now in, in situ on a couple of sites, I believe. We've definitely got a lot sitting around anyway. And then the final interface was Dibley's Level Crossing. Obviously, we wouldn't have time in the programme to even entertain closing this. Um, anyone who's worked on one of those schemes knows how notoriously difficult that is in terms of the amount of consultation. Um, so we were taking away the existing wooden boarding um, and to replace it with a more modern non-slip surface, a rubberized mat um, supplied by Strail. Obviously, those things are, the requirement is that they seat properly um, and with a new sleeper, a new base plate, um, we had to ensure that um, it was seated properly. So it required us to commission a new template. So speaking with Strail, um, they were able to do that. We, we got the um, design put in quite timely, we kept the existing trespass bars. Um, you'll notice there that we've retained the SEM56 rail. Um, we did look at upgrading to SEM60 uh, because the base plates aren't um, dual compatible. You either have one or the other. Uh, Network Rail decided that they wanted to retain the, the, the 56 pound or 56 kilo rail um, throughout the site, uh, which we ended up derogating for, which obviously was approved because they drove it. Um, as we were only providing opportunity for 80 mile an hour running, we weren't actually implementing the 80 mile an hour running. We've we've added that as a residual risk, um, partly for this level crossing. Obviously, with the increase in speed, they need to review um, sighting boards for whistle boards. There's also Chartham level crossing um, uh, further to the east. Uh, yes, further to the east, which will also it's a barrier control, so they need to look at the signalling around that as well. That wasn't part of the core works that we were involved in. So a few photos then, which we'll whiz through because we're sort of getting towards end of time. Um, this is some of the, the work that was undertaken in terms of lifting. You can see sort of how far away the crane is and how high it's lifting. Um, obviously, they were using pontoons around the bridge to allow operatives to, to sort of walk by the side of the site, uh, with it being a river. Um, the bridge decks themselves were uh, pre-drilled prior to being installed 
and the base plates and rails fitted and then lifted into position, which you can sort of see on those photos. Um, in order to facilitate all of that going on, we, we sort of gave them a cross check um, in terms of um, the, um, the detail that we provided. So we gave them um, information relating to coordinates. We gave them chainages, top of plinth levels, uh, packing details. Um, there's quite a lot of detail that went into that. And we also provide them effectively a white line diagram. So that anyone who's familiar with SSC manufacture or SSC fat testing will uh, know what these are. So effectively you define where your setting out line goes and then you offset accordingly. And because of the, the, the spiral that we were designing for the through alignment, we, we deem this to be quite a uh, sensible arrangement that people might be familiar with. And then we'll look at some photos of the actual track being installed. Uh, they're a little bit grainy, so apologise. Uh, you can see there that there's lifting eyes on top of the bridge. Those were temporary um, for the lifting operation only and were removed afterwards so that there was no need to sort of assess them for gauging because they would have come into conflict. Um, so that was some of the temporary works that we, we, we sort of considered. Um, you can see there that there's the lifting some of the Semex panels in place. Um, and they're sort of the, the runoff uh, Peter mentioned previously with the um, uh, the are they 22s, Peter? I think they're 22s. The the green ones are 35s yeah, and the black ones are 22s. There's the 22s, yeah. So, there's the 22s. so you can see the transition coming through. Um, we didn't get any photos of the um, the gram prep, unfortunately. I have asked BAM to have a look at those, um, so we don't see the geo cells. Um, that's the sort of final arrangement, all ballasted up and and ready to go. Um, you can see sort of the steps going onto the bridge for this walkway, and then you've got the cutoffs at the end, uh, which I sort of mentioned previously. So is it walkway it doesn't really work. It's probably an inspection thing for um, the bridge potentially. And then finally, there was the first train running across. Um, as Peter said, it's, we've not heard anything back, which we assume to be a good thing. Um, if it wasn't performing, no doubt we would have absolutely heard. Um, yeah. we, we've, we've done a vibration testing on it through network rail and it's meeting performance criteria. Um, the locals have complimented the lack of noise coming from the system comparative to what it used to be but they're now complaining about the fact that the um third rail shoes hitting the third rail they can hear the third rail noise now which they never could before because it was so noisy so it's it's performing well um no issues come back from the maintainers so so far so good okay and that's that's the end of the presentation so we'll open the floor to questions i think we've got about 10 minutes excellent Thank you, Chris. That was brilliant. And thank you, Peter. Really good. A good insight into Delcor as well. Um, so currently I've got no questions on the chat. How good uh, the presentation was. Yeah, that's it. Well informed, I would say. Um, yes. Well, they're all formed asleep, when they do. Well, I will <laughs> say Peter did a lot of the heavy lifting on that. So uh, thank you, Peter. <laughs> well, if I do have a question. If um, if nothing does pop up, if anyone's got so I've got a quick question and I, I've always struggled with this and it's about sort of the rate of change of stiffness. Um, and I think we suffered with this within London Underground trying to agree what we think is an acceptable rate of change of stiffness. So where you've got your transition and you showed those those what I'd say the stagger points. Um, it's, you know, uh, I know a lot of times we sort of vary the spacings to to of, of of supports. So where we have discrete supports rather than continuous support, we we sort of extend the spacing there to to allow for that sort of change in stiffness. But did you actually use a value for for this? Did you base it on sort of EN best practice, or or was it just based on what we what was previously done for London Underground? Or you know, just just be be interesting to know where you came up with that figure. Right on on London Underground, we tend to sort of utilise quite short ones because of infrastructure issues. Um, with Network Rail, our starting point is their own requirements. I think there was a study done 
by earth structures on what the optimum rate of change per second is. So that becomes our starting point. And off the top of my head, I can't remember what it was, but that's that's where we start from. Obviously, where there's infrastructure issues um, that cause us, we, we do shorten it down. Um, but we we tend to work on a rate of change of deflection per second. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's authority sort of um, specified, isn't it, in most cases? Um, I know we try to link it with speed, but in certain cases when we know the tonnage, the vehicles and so on, um, geometry and on all those other aspects and, and factors. Unfortunately, Darren, budgetary restraints come into this as well. Yeah. You mean how long you can have a transition for? <laughs> well, it, it, it's the fact that, you know, you've got sort of um, silo mentality where civil say we're not upgrading track and won't put any money in when they change the track structure which you're bolting on top so therefore you can't do what the standards require so we you know we're working on a couple now where we're trying to shorten them down to make them work to improve it but not meeting network rail standards so you know, yeah, yeah we do what yeah. we can we've got a couple of questions popping in one from peter alford uh did i see that you did not stress the track is that correct or is track jointed or have adjustment switches no, we, we did stress the track. Um, I didn't cover that off specifically. It was CWR. I did. I don't think I did cover that at the beginning. Yeah, we, we reinstated the CWR um, after the track. There was some conversation around the position of joints and whether mm. we did look to join the track. Um, but I think with the um, we go to all that work to manage the stiffnesses and transitions and then stick a joint in the middle of the um, an open joint in the middle of the bridge. He, he, sort of under, undermines what we're trying to achieve. So we did reinstate the CWR. OK, yeah, and Sean's asking a similar question, more based on the structure, I think. Was there any further issues within the CWR track fixed to the concrete slab deck in terms of varying thermal forces between the track and the bridge and any associated longitudinal movement, especially over the bridge bearing? So, yeah, I suppose, did you consider the, the We did, extension? we did. There was a discussion around that as well. Um, the, the sort of thinking was that the length of the, the, the bridge, which is around 21 metres, didn't have a, a huge bearing on the uh, the thermal performances. Um, yeah. It was definitely within a manageable limit. Um, you, you normally, once you get above, over and above that and you're looking at viaducts, etc., that becomes a, a real issue. And you, you, you're probably considering adjustment switches at that point. Yeah. But there was there was that level of consultation. Yeah. We, have, we only have 45 minutes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Liam White's uh, dropped in one there. Uh, what's your standard use of the grey type base plate? Um, obviously, green and blacks are used a lot on LU, but if you can just explain the um, the the green, sorry, the grey one to, to Liam. Right. Well, the, the grey one is a softer base plate. Um, there's, yeah, I'm discussing with LU on, on bringing it in because it does give noise and vibration benefits over um, the 22. Uh, what in LU the, they tend to use the egg for noise vibration sites, but some of the tunnels down there are so restrained the increase minor increase in height is just cannot be done. Um, so you'd normally put it in a suburban railway sort of 17, 18 ton axle load type arrangements um, where you tend to have the same stock or very similar stock running through it. Um, a 22 will give you circa five six db reduction when you go down to 17 you're getting up to sort of eight nine db reduction so it's a significant increase um and like i said before the the rubber will just go solid in secondary stiffness so there's no no danger to it sort of failing under heavy loads mm. yeah yeah uh, i recall as well peter for s and c when we did the delcor plates for camden and paddington um, you know, we were looking at rail roll of uh, of the Delcor system because the way it acts vertically and laterally, it doesn't tend to roll. It tends to drop and shift. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, yeah. If you want to explain that. <laughs> it's, it's very good because when you come along, because you preload the, you're slowly preloading the um, system with the weight of the axle, that pushes it down. So actually, because you've got stiffness in 180 degrees rather than rolling the rail as you would conventionally do you're actually pushing it down and pushing it across which gives you a better wheel rail interface 
under load, which is where you need it. Um, so it's good. The the egg system does roll, tend to roll a little bit more because that's a different system. Um, but yeah, it's it's a way that yeah we we have improved, and I think that's one of the reasons we get it slows down the defects on rail as well under high flange contact where you're getting excessive rail roll. You do change your URL interface. Brilliant. So no more questions. No hands up. Um, I can't see much more, so got a couple more minutes. Um, I think that pretty much concludes it. Um, obviously, this is recorded, so people can see this back, back over on the PWI website. Um, I'll just do one last round. Any more questions from anyone? I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> Good. Go. Got away lightly. We finished on time as well, Chris. Well done. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, I'm sure you'll get some emails, and, and I'm sure Pete will. And I think Pete, it may may be useful to. I don't know if Delcor do a catalog that explains the range, and you know, even what I've found is very interesting is sometimes if some of the 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 suppliers provide typical transition details, like this is what we did, and it really helps designers to understand, oh, right, okay, that, that's how you would design a transition using your product, you know, do a similar Darren, thing. Darren, within the, and Delcor, within but, the product approval, what we've done is we've done a design guidance documentation and a user guide. So within the network rail system under the product approval, although I haven't actually tested it because they won't let me in, <laughs> you should be able to click on a link which takes you through to design guidance, which gives you all the information on the different types of use, how to use it, um, et cetera, and guidance on the best way forward to, to utilize it in situations. So it is there within the network rail system, but obviously if anybody wants a copy of it, who's who's unable to get it, just please get in contact and I'll forward it on. Excellent. I think I might go search for it in a bit actually to see if it's there, yeah. No, that's really good. Excellent. Thank you, Chris, again. Really good and insightful. And it's good to see the whole project makeup as well, everything that came into it. And thanks, thanks, Peter, for, for giving us that 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 detailed um, sort of insight into the Delcor system. Right. So on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much. And to everyone else, uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon because your lunch break is now over. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot.